Welcome back to AP Human Driver for Dustin Fowler. In this video, we're still going on and looking a little bit more into population geography because it's so important to understand how people and why people are distributed the way they are. But it's also important to understand demographic trends over time. What makes the population grow so much starting in around the 1750s and what do people think about it then? What do people think about it now? We're gonna talk about Thomas Malthus. First of all, what was going on during the time that Thomas Malthus was alive? Well, we have the Industrial Revolution, okay? This guy was born right into the middle of all of this, and before the Industrial Revolution, as we discussed in class, there was this second agricultural revolution. Now, just a quick tidbit. The first agricultural revolution is when we started to farm, also known as the Neolithic time period, or Neolithic Revolution. The second time is when we created all these different sorts of innovations to the way we farm, such as the seed drill, such as only breeding, selectively breeding our fattest sheep or cows or whatever it might be. And what this did was it greatly improved the amount of food that we're producing. Well, if little Johnny is eating more food, then little Johnny might have more an odds of living into adulthood. And so what we did was by having more food available, more kids survived into adulthood. So on average, we were probably in the middle ages, probably having somewhere around a uh, five to six kids per couple, per family. Now, about four of those kids are surviving. And so what this does is it causes a major boom in the, in the population. Coupled that with medical advances and things like this that started to, to happen, the scientific revolution and things started to happen during the, uh, during the, the time period right after the Industrial Revolution, like in the mid-1800s and so on, you got a massive spike in population, in particular in places like Great Britain, which is where we set the stage for my boy Thomas Malthus. Okay, so my boy Thomas Malthus is living somewhere around the year 1800, okay? And he's starting to notice the trends in population. He's starting to notice the people that are growing the most. He's starting to notice that, hey, you know, our food production, even though we have increased the amount of food that we have because of the second agricultural revolution, we can only increase our food production linearly. What this means is one, two, three, four, five. If we have two fields right now, tomorrow we can have three fields. The next day we can have four fields. The next day we can have five fields, okay? And we can plant crops on these fields all day long, but they're only going to produce one field's worth of work. On the other hand, he's looking at population and he's saying, wow, population is growing geometrically. And what it means by this is exponential growth. So instead of one, two, three, four, five, we've got two, four, eight, uh, 16, and so on and so forth. Okay, so just massive exponential growth. And if you study population, you look at one of those charts that shows population growth from like the dawn of time all the way up until the Industrial Revolution, you'll see this for yourself that he ain't too far off from the truth. So what's the deal? What happened? Uh, how do we feel about Thomas Malthus today? Malthus felt pretty strongly that several things were going to happen. First of all, he felt like the, the, the poorest masses were the ones that were growing the most. Okay? And so, um, just not only did he feel like that about the poorest masses, but he also felt like we were bound to have a huge amount of competition over food resources. In order for the plant to counteract the massive rapid growth of human beings on earth, we were going to compete with each other. There was going to be war. There was also going to be disease for the sick. There was going to be famine and food shortage and general gnashing of teeth. All right, these are what Thomas Malthus calls natural checks, okay? Things that are just gonna happen that the plant's gonna do or that's gonna happen naturally in order to keep our population growth at a level height once we meet uh, 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 capacity. Not only did Malthus feel strongly that there was going to be a series of natural checks to keep population growth at a level height to an extent once, once we get to that capacity, but he also felt like in order to avoid starvation, disease, competition, all these different things over food, he felt like, hey, you know what, maybe we can enact some preventative checks, such as abstain from sex, you know, don't have so many kids. Um, uh, there was other things as well. Anything basically that would, um, that would adjust and affect the amount of babies being born, he felt like would probably be a good way of preventing this natural check cycle from going on and would basically save us from all this uh, death, destruction, and gnashing of teeth. But if you're wondering, why is it that you got this economist who's dabbling into a demographic a geography and trying to figure out what population growth you know, is gonna do and how we can prevent it? Uh, it really does make sense because what he was kind of looking at was this broader economic idea that was starting to emerge. You have different types of uh, economic systems that people were considering like 
capitalism, communism, things like this. And so what you start to, to see is he's, he's trying to point out ways that we can lessen the, 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 the impact of poverty in the developed world. All right? So poverty is a thing that's not going away. He, he understood that. But what we could try to do by controlling our population growth is control how many people would be impoverished versus how many people would, would, would be more, I guess, wealthy and well to do. And so it's really a, 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 a struggle between understanding the haves and the have nots, which many other economists were also trying to think about things having to do with population and the economy as well during a time period. So why is Thomas Malthus to us today? I mean, do we still buy this? Do we still think? Well, there are some people that still might believe in the idea that we might be overpopulating the earth and that there's going to be a shortage of resources because, I mean, come on, y'all. We're going to, I mean, UN projects us to be between 9 and 10 billion human beings on earth by 2050. And so we do have a very finite amount of resources today. But Thomas Malthus, really important distinction is that the man was only looking at food as a resource predominantly. He wasn't thinking about fossil fuels. He wasn't thinking about um, water even or other types of resources that we kind of take for granted. He was predominantly concerned with food. So today you've got a neo-Malthusians, those who kind of hold to his idea that we're going to be in competition with one another and there's going to be more problems than not. But um, there's still some controversy because neo-Malthusians hold that we're going to compete over resources like I just named. But then you've also got others, the... Um, the ones of, of the positive mentality, the ones that believe that we're gonna we're gonna go on and uh, and and with excess population comes extra minds and people that can think their way out of the problems related to population growth. And so some like Esther Bostrup, for example, was is one of the leading in uh, in opposition to Thomas Malthus and to and to, uh, the Malthusian mentality. She believes that we're going to be able to innovate ourselves out of any potential problems because you know what. So far, we have. We have not starved as a planet. Not to the, not to the point that there's starvation and, and famine and disease and things like this on a global scale. We've consistently been able to accommodate our, our global growth over the years. Part of this is because Thomas Mathis could not possibly predict that the third agricultural revolution, the green revolution, where we start to genetically modify some of our plants and things like that to increase yields and to, and to further our, our food production um, even on less land. And so in the United States, for example, we, we have a lot of a lot of maybe farmland, we have commercial agriculture, we produce enough food um, that only 3% of our population is, is really in, I mean 3% of our labor force really is in agriculture at all. And so the majority of people don't even have to farm in order to survive. Thomas Malthus couldn't have seen that coming. Right? Um, so green revolution technology in general has increased uh, uh, people's capacity to feed poorer countries like in India it's been very very beneficial. So to summarize real quick, Esther Bostrup is one of the optimists. She's one of the opposition to Thomas Malthus and the neo-Malthusian mentality that we're going to force ourselves or breed ourselves out of existence, okay? Um, but to add some support perhaps to Thomas Malthus mentality or to the neo-Malthusians, even though we haven't seen mass starvation on a global scale, we do see uh, extreme poverty and starvation and lack of resources and uh, uneven development in places like Africa and Southeast Asia and, and South Asia and all these different places that are still in the developing world. And so to an extent, you can say that Thomas Malthus' theory has come to fruition within certain regions, but as a globe, as one, it hasn't happened yet. So the possibilist would say, or not the possibilist, the uh, optimist would say, we're going to innovate our way out of that. We're never going to have these problems. We're going to prevent. Some of the neo-Malthusians would probably have said, we're growing still in an unbridled, unnatural fashion. We don't really, we don't really even know the implications fully of what population growth is going to do. We might be in for it. We might be a little in over our heads. We might be causing more problems than we're aware of. And how are we going to fix it? It might be too late. So. You got some countries like China, for example, that within their government they've enacted the one-child policy, showing that governments can have a control or at least some degree of say on the amount of kids being born. That's really important. But you've also got other places where population isn't growing and they kind of wanted to, like in most European countries. Many of these European countries, in fact, give incentives if you'll just have kids. I wish we did that. So there you go. Thomas Malthus, in a nutshell, there's a lot more you can know on the guy. He's very Googleable. I mean, look him up. 
uh, we discussed Thomas Malthus and his idea that people were going to compete over food resources and that population growth was growing too fast, it was unbridled growth, and it's unnatural and we weren't ready for it. He predicted that the impoverished masses were going to increase while the people in the elite were going to remain a very small number, which was going to show huge amounts of economic inequality uh, during his time, and he thought for the future as well. You've got optimists such as Esther Bostrup and many others that say that we're going to be able to innovate our way out of any kind of possible catastrophe related to population growth. And others like Hans Rosling, for example, which I didn't mention earlier, who discusses how um, right now we've brought down total fertility in most places so that on average in the world we're having about two, two and a half kids, which is a major deal and a major step in the right direction for development. We're asked today, neo Malthusians say that on a local scale or a regional scale, perhaps we are seeing Thomas Malthus's predictions come to truth whenever we see wars and famines and competition over resources and lack of development in some of your poorest countries like Africa and Asia. Thank you very much. If you guys got anything out of this video or you feel like it's beneficial for you, subscribe and tell your friends about me. I'm putting up more AP Human Geography uh, videos every single time I get to a new unit. Thank you very much for watching.